the first believers church of the reformation suffered instant persecution some four thousand anabaptists were burned hanged beheaded drowned even buried alive others were imprisoned or exiled excluded from guilds specially taxed and discriminated against or their farms were ravaged by wars Meanwhile, explorers and colonists were beginning to come to North America. A few Dutch Mennonites came too, but there was no permanent settlement until William Penn was granted the province of Pennsylvania by the English king who claimed the land. In 1683, a Mennonite and Quakers of Mennonite background came from Krefeld, Germany, to settle at Germantown, then six miles north of Philadelphia. Soon more Mennonites came. They built a meeting house in 1707 and replaced it in 1770 with the brick Germantown Mennonite Church. Pennsylvania was the one place in the 13 colonies where peace between native tribes and Europeans was genuine policy, though eventually the Quakers lost their majority in the legislature. Their first pastor, William Rittenhouse, built America's first paper mill. A second settlement began along Skipack Creek. Here, Mennonite school teacher Christopher Dock taught with love rather than whippings and rewarded pupils with writing models like this one. As the Franconia settlement filled, immigrants traveled west into Lancaster County Dutch Mennonites organized to help the poorest immigrants and a few Mennonites became indentured servants in exchange for ship passage. Sometimes congregations went to the wharf to buy their freedom. Amish Mennonites began arriving in 1736. Soon 3,000 Mennonites were living in eastern Pennsylvania. When England and France fought for control of North America, Penn's peace with the tribes was often broken. But Mennonite Jacob Hochstetler kept the peace even when Indians attacked his frontier home. His sharpshooting sons wanted to fire, but their father forbade it. Family members were killed, taken prisoner, or escaped. Years later, Indian chiefs who believed in peace and brotherhood would also lay down their lives in the face of white attack. Because of Quaker influence, Mennonites were exempt from oath-taking, though once all the men of the Saucon Church were jailed when Pennsylvania became independent and required a new oath of allegiance. Peace Church members were exempt from bearing arms in the Revolutionary War if they paid a fine. A war tax was levied that most Mennonites refused to pay. When Christian Funk and his followers supported paying the war tax, the first North American schism occurred in 1778. Permanent settlements in Virginia and Maryland began in the 1770s. However, a third of all American colonists had remained loyal to England, and some of these moved to Canada. Mennonites settled at Twenty Mile Creek in Ontario. The first meeting house in Canada was built in 1810 on Jacob Moyer's farm. Other settlements sprang up in Welland and York counties and in Waterloo County, the only place where Mennonites were the first white settlers. Lancaster Mennonites lent them money to pay off a large mortgage on their land. Revivals in West Lancaster County produced a new group, the Brethren in Christ Mennonite and pioneers took this church west with them. All this time, the native tribes of North America were being pushed west or north or onto reservations. The five nations of the Iroquois were defeated. A few chiefs united tribes to resist, but in vain. 
When land north of the Ohio River became the first Northwest Territory, Mennonites followed other settlers into the Middle West. The supposedly permanent Indian frontier was shoved west again to the 95th meridian. Indians became refugees and the Cherokees were compelled to make a long winter march. Behind the tribes were soldiers, then the surveyors, then settlers, and in a few years, Mennonites from Alsace, Bavaria, Switzerland, the Palatinate, Amish Mennonites came up the Mississippi to Illinois. Swiss journeyed to near Bern, Indiana. Others settled in Iowa. But migration was not the only happening of the 1800s. Both in Ontario and the States, factionalism was splitting churches. Mennonites divided over secret societies, prayer meetings, foot washing, discipline, and lifestyles. John Oberholzer's new methods led to a split in Pennsylvania. Henry Igley's rebirth led to the forming of the Evangelical Mennonite Church. Joseph Stuckey's refusal to excommunicate a member led to the Central Conference. John Holdeman's preaching led to the Church of God in Christ Mennonite. Daniel Crable united the Oberholzer and other groups to form the General Conference Mennonite Church. During the American Civil War, the government said Peace Church members could pay a fee to hire someone to take their place. The Peace Churches objected and the Northern Draft Act allowed the fee to help sick and wounded instead. In the South, some Virginia Mennonites hid in the mountains or tried to escape north. A few were caught and imprisoned. Others joined the army. But we won't shoot! Sir. They won't take correct aim. As still more tribes became refugees, there were uprisings, battles, and massacres. Great buffalo herds were nearly wiped out by wanton shooting. Once free tribes half starved on poor land. This made great tracts of land in Canada and the States available for sale to farmers. At the same time, European Mennonites who had migrated eastward to Russia realized that they were going to lose some freedoms. Tsar Alexander II launched a reform program that included universal military conscription and centralized government. Where to go? Cornelius Jansen and Bernard Warkentine recommended the states. William Hespeler and Jacob Schantz recommended Manitoba. In 1873, a delegation went to North America to decide the issue. The Berchtal and Kleinegemeinde delegates liked Canada's large land areas and promise of exemption from military service. The Malachna and Prussian Mennonite delegates liked the similarity of U.S. conditions to those north of the Black Sea. Already, some Mennonites were moving into Kansas from the east. Bernard Warkentine built the first North American grain mill that could grind hard red turkey wheat, the winter wheat that would turn the Great Plains of Canada and the States into an international breadbasket. Now Malachna created a mutual aid treasury, and North American Mennonites raised money to help Polish Mennonites migrate. In 1874, Mennonites began crossing the Atlantic in a steady stream, disembarking from one steamship after another at New York, Quebec, and Toronto. Where long was that deal, Mama? But the last man at all the stuff. 800 Alexander Vol church members came in one group, arriving on two steamships. Gross, Mama, a stout. A Hudson Bay Company steamship, the International, brought the first Russian Mennonites to Fort Garry on the Red River. Hutterite Mennonites bought 25,000 acres for $25,000 in Dakota Territory and started the first Hutterite Bruderhof in North America. A second colony was begun the same year. 
the da. Da. Tom da sei mat dem Mensch seine Tang it strake. What kind of apples are this? Yep, they are rotten. They aren't apples, they're tomatoes. More came in the next few years, and in the 1880s, emigration was more difficult and farms had to be sacrificed. Yet, nearly 150 families made the journey. We are here! Yes, we are here. These are the potatoes, Gross. Oh, Mama, we are not here quite so smart, we have no status here. Altogether, some 18,000 Mennonites migrated, around 7,000 to Canada and the rest to the States. It was a time of mutual aid and sharing. Some owed for their farm equipment and even their sod houses. They had to adjust. Canadian winters were harder, but droughts less severe. The prairie plowed more easily, but grasshoppers destroyed one crop. They missed the nightingales of home. But gradually, hard winter wheat spread over the plains, dotted by mulberry and apricot trees brought from Russia. All the Mennonite sects spread westward. Some Manitoba groups clung closely to cultural traditions and kept their European-type farm villages. Occasionally, these traditions were the cause of separations and further migrations. But elsewhere in the Mennonite church were awakenings that prepared congregations for Sunday schools and curriculum, evangelism, youth meetings, mission work. Mennonite was coming to mean Anabaptist Christians from many cultures and traditions. However, even in the New World, it was not easy to practice all of Jesus' teachings. During World War I, non-resistant German-speaking Mennonites were sometimes targets of war hysteria. Canadian conscientious objectors were given indefinite leaves of absence. In the States, President Wilson did not decide for non-combatant military service until 1918. Some Mennonites accepted, some refused. A number were imprisoned, a few mistreated, and two Hutterite Mennonites, John and Michael Hofer, died at Fort Leavenworth. Meanwhile, civil war had begun in Russia. Anna Berg wrote, The anarchists are killing and burning everything. In many places, hunger is already the number one killer. Ghost-like figures move aimlessly through the country, begging for a piece of bread. On top of this, Mennonites were being inducted into the army and agriculture was being collectivized. Relief work had begun in Europe and Russia. One of the relief workers, Clayton Kratz, disappeared in the turmoil of the Civil War. A study commission was sent to North America to choose areas for immigration. David Taves, chairman of the Canadian Mennonite Board of Colonization, struggled with immigration prohibitions and quotas. Meetings began with J.S. Dennis of the Canadian Pacific Railway, even though there was no money. Taves's determination to save Mennonites in Russia was matched only by Dennis's faith in Mennonite honesty. $400,000 had to be raised immediately in spite of some strong opposition. 18 U.S. conferences united to help. Some Canadians began raising extra food for the incoming refugees. Even bedfast Jacob Evert played a role publicizing needs and locating relatives. At last, the first group of around 700 immigrants arrived at Rostron, Saskatchewan in July 1923 to be met by friends and relatives. Tears fell as they praised God together. Much more money was needed to bring in thousands of immigrants. Some U.S. money went to finance settlements in Mexico that did not last, but by 1926, there was more united support, just as Russian Mennonites were finding it harder to get passports. Only a minority made it. Over 20,000 persons in the largest migration of all, with the railroad having loaned almost $2 million. The loan was slow to be paid because of the depression, drought, and crop failures. 
C.F. Clausen and others endured sacrifice and humiliation to collect money still owed. Then Hitler invaded Europe in 1939 and Canadian conscientious objectors were assigned to work camps in national parks and forest experimental stations. This time, American peace churches were prepared with a new model. The government provided work projects, but the churches maintained and administered camps and supported the workers. As the German army invaded Russia, it sent German-speaking Russians back toward Germany. Some Mennonites were boxcarred out of Russia. Others followed the army's retreat in a painful trek. One way or another, some 12,000 Mennonites reached the West, but many more than that were forcibly repatriated by the Soviets. In 1946, J.J. Thiessen, the colonization board's new chairman, brought David Taves the news that Mennonites had at last paid the railway. Money was once again needed for refugee immigrants. The Mennonite Central Committee sent C.F. Clausen to search out refugees in bombed out cities and get them to camps for medical checks, passports, ship tickets. But Canada would take only a few and the U.S. still had quotas. The next choice was South America, especially Paraguay. Supported by Mennonite giving, over 15,000 refugees found new homes. A few good things did come out of all the suffering. When the draft was reactivated in the States, alternative service included both domestic and overseas projects. Migration has continued from east to west, country to city, to and from Central and South America. Overall, there have been four main migrations in 300 years as Mennonites have tried to practice Jesus' teachings, even when this meant the sacrifice of leaving their homes. Mennonites must never forget. They have received tribal land from the dispossessed, emigration help from European Mennonites, government provision for alternative service, strength from all who lived and died for peace and brotherhood. In return, Mennonites gave North America examples of separation of church and state, of mutual aid and simple living, of service and peacemaking. Jesus' challenge to Mennonites is to remain pilgrims who divest themselves of excess baggage that dims faith and witness in order to journey on toward God's new world.